Last week, we quickly raced through the ten disasters caused by Pharaoh's refusal to simply let the Israelites, the enslaved Israelites, leave for a three-day festival in the desert to worship God. Often called the ten plagues, the first one was really just an effort to impress Pharaoh by turning a shepherd's rod into a snake. But failing to impress Pharaoh, the stakes were quickly raised when the Nile River was turned to blood and there was no water to drink and it wasn't even fit to make a good Bloody Mary. And then thousands of frogs emerged from the Nile and began jumping everywhere and getting into everything and that's kind of cute and kind of gross. And then all the lice-covered people itching and the animals scratching themselves and then flailing arms swatting away swarms of insects and then a fatal disease affecting Egyptian livestock and then everyone covered in painful blisters and boils. But one attempt after another and nothing would budge Pharaoh. If you remember, this Pharaoh came to power claiming not to know Joseph. Egyptians forgot this, why this group of immigrants, the, the, the descendants of Joseph, were living in their land. This Joseph, who had skillfully saved the entire nation of Egypt from starvation. They forgot, and so Pharaoh was able to scapegoat the Israelites and eventually enslaved them. And after years of suffering, God heard their cries and personally got involved by sending Moses and Aaron to get them released. But just by approaching Pharaoh, they actually made things worse. Pharaoh forced the people to work even harder by making the same number of bricks without providing them the straw to make them. And the people rightfully complained. And Moses complained that God's doing nothing to help. Then seven plagues in, an odd narrative shift. So Pharaoh had been going back and forth between relenting, saying, just go already, and then changing his mind. But after the seventh disaster, God made Pharaoh stubborn. And now it's not just a story about an obnoxiously rich and powerful man refusing to grant the people a break, but something much more complicated, of which I have yet to find a satisfying explanation that doesn't make God look like a jerk, prolonging their suffering and causing more. So the eighth disaster had the, was the greatest hailstorm anyone had ever seen, and then a plague of locusts. Of course, to me, devastating hailstorms and plagues of locusts just sound like North Dakota in summertime along with constantly swatting away mosquitoes the size of birds. And then there were three days of darkness that covered Egypt, which just sounds like winter in North Dakota. <laughs> but then, and there's nothing funny about this, the worst of all, death came to the oldest child and animal in every family. Terrible agony for every household in Egypt, except for Israelite houses marked with the blood of a lamb, for those families God would pass over. And finally, that was all. It was too much. And Pharaoh relented, and the people could go. Well, they took off so fast that the yeast hadn't even yet raised the bread dough. And they left, and they walked for several days and came to the edge of the Reed Sea. And they made camp along the seashore where a woman was selling seashells. I didn't know if that one would land or not. They deserved a waterside retreat, except that it also meant they were trapped. And soon enough, Pharaoh changed his mind and sent all the military might at his disposal to force the slaves back to Egypt. And the people were furious at Moses and complained bitterly that they could have just died in Egypt without all this trouble. You should have left us alone. But as you heard last week, Moses raised his hand and God blew a strong wind which dried up the sea for the Israelites to walk through and once they were safely across, the wind turned and created havoc for the chariots and the Egyptian soldiers and all perished in the sea. God saved the people. 
And once they were on the other side, Miriam picked up a tambourine and led them in singing and dancing all day and all night. Horse and rider into the sea, God has saved us from the enemy. And that's where we stopped last week. And so here we are the next morning, after a good night's sleep. They traveled forward. God only knows where they're going. Actually, I mean, only God knew where they were going. But after three days in the wilderness, they had run out of water. They had yet to find any water. And so men, women, and children alike sat down on the ground and wailed, why didn't God just let us die in the comfort of Egypt? And if brick-making seven days a week in the hot Egyptian sun was comfort, then you know they were really miserable. But with no other choice, they kept moving until they came across a spring in Mara. Water! Word passed back to Miriam to dig out her tambourines. And people stood around and with great anticipation watched the first person taste what they expected would be the most wonderful, fresh, cool water that people had been dreaming of for days. But before Miriam, Miriam could start dancing, the person spit out the water. It was bitter. Which shouldn't have surprised them because the word Mara means bitter. And so no surprise that you go to a place to get water in a, that it is called bitter and that it's bitter. But not to fear, God pointed Moses to a tree and Moses threw branches into the water and it became sweet. And they waited there until everyone had filled up all their water jugs, and then they kept traveling until they arrived in Elam. Now, Elam is a beautiful desert paradise, described as having 70 palm trees and 12 springs of water. You could advertise it on a Travelocity as a literal palm springs in the desert, minus all the mid-century modern architecture. And they spent six weeks there, of rest and relaxation. And when they returned to their travels, I can only imagine that more than a few people complained about having to leave. And yup, as soon as they started to move, why didn't God let us die in the comfort of Egypt? You let us out here to starve. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt free of charge. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. Back in Egypt, we had pots of cooking meat. They were hungry. And once again, the whole company of Israel complained bitterly against Moses and Aaron. Temple Beth Shalom set up a voicemail system for dealing with this kind of thing. If you want to hear our service schedule, press 1. For membership information, press 2. To complain to the rabbi, press 3. To complain about the rabbi, press 4, 5, or 6. <laughs> Moses, in turn, complained to God, who promised to rain down bread from the skies. Moses and Aaron informed the people, God has heard your complaints. And by the way, just so you know, when you complain, it doesn't bother us. I mean, your complaints are against God, and do you really want to complain against a God who can send frogs, lice, boils, bugs, and hail? I think we call that being passive-aggressive, which is obviously a tactic as old as humankind. But Moses assured them that God had heard their complaints and promised to send them bread every morning, adding, and then you will know that I am the Lord, your God. In the morning, that bread was a layer of dew around the camp, described as thin flakes, as thin as frost on the ground. And they wondered, uh, this, is, this is food? I am a very, very, very picky eater, asked my husband. So I understand when the people nervously asked, what is this? And Moses said, this is the bread God has given you to eat. And someone said, give it to Mikey. Let's see if he likes it. <laughs> the Bible says it was like white coriander seed 
I had to look that up and discovered it's like cilantro. I don't know what that is either. But reportedly, uh, which I've heard of cilantro, but reportedly coriander seeds taste, quote, earthy, and the leaves are pungent and citrus-like. Though I read on Wikipedia that some people think it tastes like dish soap. I don't know. If Art told me it was in whatever he cooked, I'd probably say, I don't think I'm going to like this. But the Bible, they should have tried it. I think they did. But the Bible says it tasted like honey wafers. Now that I can get behind. And the people called it manna. Manna from heaven. And here's how it worked. It came every morning. People were, gather, were to gather up about two quarts before the sun burned it away. And they could take as much as they needed for that day. But of course that wasn't enough for some people. But the too much they took turned rotten and became infested with worms. On the other hand, those who didn't take enough found they had just enough. And on Fridays, they were to gather enough for two days, and it wouldn't spoil. And that way, they could rest on the Sabbath. And so they ate these delicious honey wafers every day for 40 years. But not just manna. So every day at supper time, a flock of birds, perfect for roasting, flew down and covered the camp. And so they were provided honey nut Cheerios every morning and quail every night. That's not bad. Although I'd probably get tired of it before too long. And sure enough, it wasn't too long before the people complained about something else. Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us, our children and our livestock, with thirst? And back and forth we go. Moses turned around and angrily complained, what should I do with these people? Because Moses hadn't learned the skill of customer service. When people stood at the edge of the sea and complained, weren't there enough graves in Egypt for us to die there? Moses should have said, I'm sorry this has been such an upsetting experience for you. And when they crossed the sea and complained about dying of thirst, Moses should have said, tell me more about what this has been like for you. And when they complained about being hungry, reminiscing about free cucumbers and leeks and onions back in Egypt, Moses should have said, I hear that you're hungry. I'm committed to making this better for you. And then turn to God, help! Of all the things people do in the Bible, this is one of the most universal to complain. It's like we can't help ourselves. Maybe we can look at all that time in the wilderness as needing 40 years of gratitude training. Do you notice in all these stories, no one ever once said thank you? Thank you for the retreat in Palm Springs. Thank you for turning bitter water sweet. Thank you for the tasty honey flakes delivered right to our doors. And thank you for the quail from Uber Eats. And maybe, maybe just a, a, gift, a gift certificate for a massage to thank Moses and Aaron for the hell they were putting them through. However, to their defense, the Israelites had been enslaved for years. And scholars debate between maybe 86 to 430. It's a lot of years. But regardless of the length, they were shaped by a system that took advantage of them and debased their humanity. Walter Brueggemann decided to describe their needing 40 years of wilderness for freedom training, learning how not to belong to someone else, but only to God. And so I don't mean to equate our experiences, but you know, we too are shaped by dehumanizing systems like commercialism and capitalism. We need to ask, well, who has a vested interest in trying to convince us that what we have is not enough? And that, in fact, more is still not enough? And why do people describe time as too important to waste, as though sitting by the ocean has no purpose? And who says a person doing is more important than a person being? 
And why is it that by the virtue of the size of a paycheck, some people are more important than others? In fact, some people are expendable. That diminishes all of us. And we hear a barrage of such messages six days a week. And so to disrupt them, we gather here to try to break through this dehumanization for ourselves and others trapped by such systems. Once a week, we gather to worship the one who is greater than all of that, to say thank you, to express gratitude. But that's not enough. This is something we actually do need more of, a regular practice of gratitude in between Sundays. And so I'll start with myself. David, when it takes you more than 60 seconds to get past uh, St. Vincent's School in the morning on your way to work at drop-off time, instead of complaining, express gratitude for all the teachers who serve our community, thankfully preparing a new generation of educated citizens. I could give you a whole lot more examples like that, but you get the idea. It may be, you know, old-fashioned, but can we stop to express gratitude before a meal? Or before going to bed, or while brushing our teeth, or while riding the elevator, or walking the dog? And you may think, oh, those are so insignificant, they're too small. But it really doesn't matter what or how long. Just think of anything that disrupts thoughts of scarcity. Something that disrupts my saying, I don't have enough. A prompt that when we feel ourselves starting to complain, to say, I'm grateful. Sometimes it's hard to create a list. I get tired of trying to create a list. But we can simply say, I'm grateful. And it will apply to anything. It's so vitally important. Because when you are grateful, you're not fearful. And when you're not fearful, you're not violent. And when you're not violent, you realize you have enough. And when you stop feeling like, I never have enough, you're willing to share. And you know that when you share, you have enough, which in turn makes us grateful, which means we are not fearful, which in turn makes us grateful. You see this circle and cycle we can get ourselves into because we have enough every day. Do you? So God, transform all these words and thoughts, both those spoken and those heard, into what we need for our journeys today. Amen.